So yesterday we, we, we talked about Newton's laws of motion. There are three laws. And we ended with the third one. Um, and this is basically states when something's, one body is exerting a force on another body, that other body exerts an equal opposite force on this body. And it's demonstrated here. If someone's pushing with uh, some force here over some time, pushing this person, it doesn't matter. This final motion is the same. You, this person could be pushing with the equal and opposite force on that person. We don't have to distinguish between action and reaction. Okay. Sometimes, as I mentioned to you, if this push, this push <coughs> person pushes on that person, that's the that's an action force on this person. The reaction is the fact that there's a force on this person that pushes this person back. Those forces are equal and opposite, so we don't need to use, normally, almost always, we don't need to use the word action, act, words action and reaction. So here's a um, simple example of this, quantitative example. <coughs> okay, so we got, uh, this is very similar to that demonstration with the two people yesterday, that we were just talking about. So there's two people on ice, very low negligible friction. <coughs> and person one, we're told that person one exerts a force of 120 newtons for a certain amount of time, a constant force for 0.8 seconds on this person number two. And we want to find the final velocities of the skaters. We know that, we'll call this positive, we know that this skater is going to be moving this way, and what's this one going to be doing? Be moving the other way, right? by Newton's third law. And we know specifically what force is exerted on this person. It's equal and opposite. It's 120 Newtons that way for the same amount of time. That's what Newton's law's third law tells us. So let's write down Newton's second law. Or let's focus on the uh, second skater here first. <coughs> F12 is the force of 1 on 2. It's 120 Newtons. That's going to cause an acceleration. And we know that the force is the product of the mass and the acceleration. So we can solve this for the acceleration. We know the force. We know the mass. We can solve for the acceleration. We can plug the numbers in, and we get 1.5 meters per second squared. So <coughs> while the person is pushing, while there's this contact force, the acceleration of this person is 1.5 meters per second squared that way. And it lasts for 0.8 seconds. So we can find whatever you want to know here. This has now become a kinematics problem. So if we want to find the final velocity here, we just use this equation of constant acceleration. Right? This is the linear. The initial velocity is zero. And it's just the acceleration times the time. We know the acceleration. We know the time. We get 1.2 meters per second. So that's the final velocity of this person. 1.2 meters per second. Okay, so now we're going to look at this person, the motion of this person. So what this person feels is the force of two on one. That's all that's relevant to, to this person. This person's going to feel a force exerted on him or her given by 120 newtons this way, by Newton's third law. So again, here's Newton's second law. We solve for the acceleration, and now I've explicitly put Newton's third law in here. F21 is minus F12. That's Newton's third law. And we know that F12 is 120 Newtons. So, you know, you don't have to go through all these steps here. There's different ways you can look at it. But you want to realize that there's a force of minus 120 Newtons on person one. That's the bottom line. And that allows us to determine the acceleration in the negative direction. And again, we get the final velocity with our kinematical equation here. No initial velocity of person one. We know the acceleration, minus two. We plug it in, and we get an answer. All right. So the f let's look at the final velocities. Are they the same? No. Which This person's moving faster, and that makes complete sense why. Less mass. Yeah, right. The less mass this person has, the greater velocity that person's going to have. Because there's a force exerted on a certain time. 
and there's an the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass by Newton's second law. So the lighter that person is, the less massive that person is, the greater the velocity is going to be. Now, um, <clears throat> this is actually, um, we're not going to do this again. Uh, okay, <laughs> because, well, maybe it'll be on a homework set or quiz or something. But there's a much more transparent way of looking at this in terms of momentum. Some of you probably heard of, you know, you know about this. So later on in the course, this calculating this and how you look at this will become very obvious. Will become very obvious once we do momentum, and we'll do. A, I'm sure we'll do a similar example, but it's going to take a while. Okay. Any questions about that problem? So here's a summary of Newton's laws of motion, the three laws of motion. The, when you have a net force of zero on an object, it moves with constant velocity, no acceleration. The velocity could be zero. Uh, the problem is that this only occurs in certain reference frames called inertial frames, and this really defines inertial frames. And I didn't, I don't have this in the notes, and I didn't point it out yesterday, but one of the first things, I should try to get it in there. If you just naively look at these two things, you'll you, it looks like this is just a special case of this. Okay? If you look at this statement right here, net force means zero acceleration. Why don't we just say, well, a special case of Newton's second law is when you have a net force of zero, you have acceleration equals zero. Why did Newton make this a separate law? Well, it can now be revealed, right, that the reason is it really defines the inertial frames. It's really how we define an inertial frame. So we need this first to define what we normally do, you know, we apply Newton's laws in, because they're only valid in inertial frames. So the second law tells us how a body responds to a force, it's acceleration. And the third is that when you have inter interaction forces, forces between two bodies, they're always equal and opposite. <coughs> Okay, now, there was a problem um, yesterday with forces. I, uh, somebody asked a question. Well, um, was it Luke? Yes, no. Oh, it was there, David? There is movement, right? That's what we're talking about. Okay, no, no, this had to do with, uh, it doesn't matter, but there was some confusion about forces. And I realized after class, of course, we didn't really define forces. We didn't rigorously define a force. We just kind of motivate it by taking the special case of a spring to just kind of motivate what a force is and what a constant force means. We didn't define force. In fact, there are people who it's, it's hard to rigorously or you know, very properly <coughs> define force. In fact, there are some people who believe that this is really just a definition of force, <laughs> all right? I think it's more than, I think most people think it's more than that, but it's not real clear, you know, it's not real clear. So, we need to do something. We need to go through examples of forces to give you a feeling for what forces are. And it makes sense that we do because we really didn't define it very well, properly. Okay, so we're going to look at three forces here in this chapter. What's something called weight, something called normal force, and tension. You have ideas of what these are. We're going to look at them you know, properly here. Now, there are other forces, of course. There's a multitude of forces. And what's relevant in mechanics is also friction, drag, which we've been, you know, we've, I keep telling you we're going to talk about, and the spring forces. Those are, it's best to postpone those until um, the next chapter. Okay, so we're going to look at the simpler forces right now. So first is weight. <coughs> this is um, the force of an astronomical body like the, you know, the Earth. The Earth is there, is there a force on this rod here, this pointer, right? Downward force. And here's a situation. Here's the Earth or some other astronomical body. <coughs> we have some mass and there's this downward force. <coughs> and we know we typically write this on diagrams, and this signifies that there is a gravitational field, what we call a field here. And what it specifically, quantitatively, what it means is, is in the absence of drag 
and other forces. If you just have the gravitational force, that's the acceleration that the object's going to have. All right? It's g, and on the sur near the surface of the Earth, it's about 9.8 meters per second squared. So this weight is this force here. How do we how do we quantify that? Well, first thing to notice is that the weight, very naturally. Uh, and you can treat this as an experimental fact. If you double the mass, you're going to double the weight. The weight has to be proportional to the mass. And we actually talked a little bit about this yesterday in our how we define mass. Remember the, the gravitational, de the two pan balance, how we define what mass is there? So the weight has to be proportional to the mass. Now we need to be precise. It's a physics course. We want to be precise. We want to remove this proportionality. What's the proportionality constant? Well, if you think of Newton's second law here, in a vacuum, the force is the mass times the acceleration. Here's the force, there's the mass, what's the acceleration? It's what we call g. So we know that this is true. So if you compare this and this, you'll see that, um, excuse me, <laughs> well, I didn't write it down here. So we know that the acceleration here is going to be g, that this is going to be g. So we conclude this very simple fact that the weight is given by m times g. Now there's an important consequence here, and Galileo uh, recognized this. Okay? Um, <coughs> he was apparently the first one to recognize this. And we're going to look at this from a modern, not from Galileo's point of view. Galileo's point of view was always a little, a little different, okay? <laughs> and he was, uh, he was right sometimes. He was wrong a lot of times. It's remarkable. Uh, but he somehow always, he, he made a lot of progress. You know, he was the first one to say, forget about friction. You know, forget about drag. We'll worry about that later. And everyone thought that, oh no, if you've got a, any kind of a theory of nature, phys physical nature, you obviously have to include, you know, a, an object, if you pu push an object along, it comes to rest, right? So you have to explain that. That's hard to explain. It's going to take, it's taking us, we're, we're still not there, right? We don't know how to describe this. Something, uh, uh, this move, can I do this? Over. We can't explain that yet. We can't quantify that, right? We just know, well, if it's got constant excel, we can do some calculations. So Galileo was the first one who said, forget about that. Let's, do, let's, let's cut out th these. These are just complications that we'll deal with later. Let's just try to establish the basic facts. And he had arguments that when you reduce the fr friction here, that this would just move at a constant velocity. Okay, so anyway, um, here's what Galileo in, in different, I'm going to, this, this is our, we're going to use Newton's second law, okay? Um, when I imagine um, looking at the acceleration of different objects here that have different masses in the same gravitational field, let's say near the surface of the Earth, I have different masses. Newton's second law tells me that the force is the mass times the acceleration. This is really simple. Okay, Newton's second law tells us the force is the mass times the acceleration. What's the force here? Well, it's, it's the weight, right? In this case, and g is going to be the acceleration, but wait, is the acceleration. And we've just seen that the weight is given by n times g, right? So do you notice what happens here? You see how the mass cancels out? The mass is canceling out. This is an important fact. Because in this case, we have Newton's second law. We know that the acceleration is inversely proportional to mass. We know that mass has to be there. When we have a force that's proportional to the mass, the two masses cancel. They exactly cancel each other. So the bigger the mass, the harder it is to accelerate it. But the bigger the force is here, and they exactly cancel. So all objects in a vacuum fall with the same acceleration. Sometimes called Galileo's law. 
Uh, now, near the surface of the Earth, one kilogram equals 2.205 pounds. Why do I have a quotes here? Because this is this is like apples and this is oranges. These are these are not the same units. This is a unit of mass. This is a unit of force. So the meaning of this is, is that one kilogram here, here, this is about a kilogram, on the surface of the Earth, it weighs um, 2.205 pounds, okay? If you go to the moon, um, what happens? What's it gonna weigh? Well, we all know it's a, the it's acceleration to gravity is about one, roughly one-sixth on, on our moon on the surface of our moon. So um, you're going to get one-sixth that it'll weigh this. The mass is the same. The mass is not going to change, okay? But the weight will change. You go out into deep space, the weight's zero. Yes, Damon? So it's not arbitrary, but which one's more correct? Saying kilograms on the Earth or pounds on Earth? It's whatever's convenient for you. The proper statement is one kilogram weighs 2.205 pounds on the surface of the Earth. And so what were the choices, what were the two things you said? I said which one was more correct, grams or pounds? They're, they're equally valid. They're equally valid if you assume that you're on Earth. Yes, you exactly. I, I, so that's, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, let's wait for the, for the demonstration. Okay. Let's wait and then see if that clears it up. So let's do it, before we do this, this real simple demo, um, <clears throat> let's just do some simple calculations here. Let's compare one kilo, and this will help too, one kilogram on Earth and also on Jupiter on the surface, and these are the surfaces of these planets, right? They're, um, one kilogram is, the mass doesn't change, okay? And, and you can think, if you want to think about that, imagine you're on the surface of the Earth and you exert one Newton force on a kilogram. You're going to see an acceleration of one meter per second squared. What if you do the same thing on Jupiter or on the moon? You exert a force, a ho forget gravity now. You're going to see the same acceleration, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter where you are. So, um, so the mass is the same. However, the weights are going to be different. The weight is given by n times g. So on Earth here, it's one kilogram. It's 9.8 newtons. So one kilogram weighs on the surface of the Earth weighs about 9.8 newtons. On Jupiter, the acceleration due to gravity is about 25 meters per second squared. So it's going to weigh. It's going to be greater. And you would feel that. You you would weigh greater on the surface of Jupiter. Now, okay, there is a problem with the surface of Jupiter because it's like it's gas, I think, right? So let's not worry about that. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here's, here's a, a, dem, a simple demo. So here's a spring scale. So in here, I don't know how they do it, but there's some kind of torsional spring in here. So when you put a weight, apply a force here, like a weight, by putting a kilogram on here, it's going to tell you what that, what that force is, or the weight. It's going to tell you what the weight is. It's calibrated in newtons. So if this is a kilogram, which you know that it is, what should this thing read? It's, it's in new, calibrated in newtons, sorry. So, mg, one kilogram, g is 9.8 meters per second squared. We should, it should be nine point, about 9.8 newtons. All right? Um, now here's another scale, and I, I wish I had a, this, you can't really, you can't see this, I just have to describe it to you. I really need to get a, a better scale. This one, on, on the left here, it's, it has two calibrations. On the left, it's in grams. It says grams here. And the full deflection is, and this is just a simple linear spring, not a torsional spring. You can see the spring and see the spring. And the full scale deflection is a thousand grams, which is one kilogram. So if I put a kilogram on here, it should be deflecting the full amount. And it doesn't max, it uh, doesn't bottom out. They give you a little extra, yeah, it bottoms out there. So it's, it's still, only the spring force is being exerted here. It hasn't hit the stops in the back here. 
okay, fine. Now the question is this, what if we do this on the moon? Which scale is going to be, are they both going to be right? Are they both going to be wrong? What scales, if I take this to the moon, what's the reading going to be? It's going to be about one-sixth this, which is correct. That's the weight of, that's the weight of a kilogram on the moon. What's this, what's, one, what's this one going to tell me? It's going to tell me, oops, excuse me, it's going to tell me that this thing has a mass calibrated of, of one-sixth of a kilogram. It's wrong. It's wrong. Okay. That's the demo. It's not a big deal. But. <laughs> okay. So Damon, does that, I don't know. So, so. so, so yes, but then it brings me another question. Is that really wrong with the balloon? I mean, we say it's wrong. Okay, what, what is it? You have to be precise. Uh, sorry, the, the weight. So. Okay, the, the oh, this is the weight. The, 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 uh, this is force. This is. Kilogram. Oh, yeah. It's wrong. It's wrong on the moon. This thing, it's telling me it has, on the moon, it'll tell me that it has a mass. I can read off the mass in grams, and it's going to be one-sixth of a kilogram. That's not the mass of this object. The mass is invariant. doesn't matter where you are. So it's wrong. In this case, this, in this situ specific situation here, it's wrong. This is intended. This calibration is intended for the surface of the Earth. This will work anywhere. You can go out in space, right? And I put this on here, what am I going to get? Zero. That's correct. Zero is correct. There's no weight. You could be going up in an elevator. We'll talk a little bit more about this, I think, later in this chapter. I could be going up and accelerating up in an elevator. What's this thing going to read? It's going to be greater. If the elevator is decelerating, it's, going to read, it's, it's telling me the weight, and it's accurate. But if you ca calibrate it in kilograms, it's only for one, one plate, you know, one situation, like the surface of the Earth. So the question is, how do you determine the mass if you're not on the surface of the Earth? Yeah, well, two ways to go. What? Is it two ways to go? You load up one side. Yeah, that's one way. You can. That's a gravitational way. But there's no apparently no distinction between gravitation and inertial. So if you use a double pan balance, then it does. That's a very good point. Doesn't matter, right? As long as you have some gravitational field. I guess you don't have to have any. You know, if you're out in deep space, you don't, the mass you have to add here to balance it is zero, so it works there too. You could also do it inertially. You can do an experiment. H how, do they, uh, how do astronauts measure their weight in space? They need to monitor this. You guys know how they do it? A spring system. Okay, a spring system. What, uh, so, but it's, they're often weightless. Well, maybe, I think you're getting on the right track. They do it inertially. They have, um, I don't know specifically how they do it. It may be a torsional, oh no, that would involve the moment of, no, I don't, they don't want to do it that way. They some, yeah, maybe somebody knows. They do it inertially. They essentially look at their acceleration. They get their mass by looking at the acceleration. They have some, does anybody know? There's some, um, Yes. If you have some kind of system that exerts a force that accelerates you back and forth. Yeah, Ken Bird, who was, uh, was mentioning it the other day, how they, they have a spring that they, they put against each other themselves and then measure uh, oscillations to the spring. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah, that's good. Right. So, unfortunately, we're not going to get to it in this. I don't think we get to it here. But oscillations of a mass on a spring, if you know the spring constant, which quantifies the the force you get from a spring, how it depends with distance. And you measure the period of the oscillations, you can determine the mass. Right. Yep. So they're doing it, but conceptually you can imagine that they're just exerting some force. Conceptually imagine exerting some force on the person or anything and looking at the, ex measuring the acceleration, you can get the mass. F is equal to ma. If you know F you, and you know A, you can find M. Okay, so here's the second force. It's called the normal force. Normal is often, um, uh, often synonymous with perpendicular. It's not all, you know, it's, it's uh, when we use it in math and science and engineering, it's, um, it's essentially the same as perpendicular. So what it means in this case is normal force is the force of a surface on something, okay? And it's the force that's perpendicular 
to the plane of the surface. So if I've got a horizontal table here, right, and I've got some mass on it, right now that table is exerting a normal force perpendicular to the surface of the table and it's upward. And why do I know that? Because it's not accelerating due to gravity, right? So, so, so in, this, in a situation like this, I know that the normal, I can draw a force diagram. Well, this is our, our first, I think this is our first force diagram. Okay, so this is, gonna, this is a big deal in this course. It allows you to solve problems and you don't want to skip it, as I will emphasize to you, starting, starting later on. Right now it's not a big deal, but we can draw the forces on the object. This is a diagram. You can't, students like you know, to save time and effort, so they'll often draw force and you know, we do it, professors do it too, <laughs> physicists do it too. But in simple cases you can get away with that, but in more complicated cases you want to abstract from that, you want to go to another thing here that we call a force diagram, some people call it a free body diagram, where you represent the object you're interested in or objects by a point here and you draw all the forces on that object. So that's, this is a force diagram here. In this case, I know that I have to have um, this, this normal force is pointing this way perpendicular to the surface. I know that I have to have n is equal to mg because there's no acceleration in this direction. Okay? Does the same thing hold if the force is inclined? Well, let's, we'll see. We'll see, okay? Now there's another force that this surface can exert on this mass. Which way is it? it realistically? If I push this and it comes to rest, what's going on? It's, if it's decelerating like that, it has a negative acceleration, there's got to be a force there. What's that, what do we call that? Friction, right? Okay, so friction is perpendicular to the normal force here. Um, oh, so we're going to do that next, yeah. So let's do the inclined plane now. We'll do this uh, more uh, thoroughly as an ex later as an example, but for right now, the normal, we're just doing this as an example of a normal force. The normal force is normal to the surface, okay? And the surface is here, so the normal force now, our force diagram looks like this. And it's gonna point at a direction here. And you can see from the, from the geometry here that um, if, if this is inclined at angle theta, this will have to be at angle theta there. And you can imagine this like as a hinge here. When this comes down to here, we have zero angle. As I move this here, I go through some angle there, I'm going to go through the same angle here and also in my diagram it'll be the, this angle here will be the same as this angle here. You'll quickly adapt to this geometrical stuff, but in the beginning you may want to actually go through a little bit of geometry calculation. We have to transfer angles. You can see that this angle right here, this is a, a different angle. It's, t it's technically not the same angle, it's right, it's got different, it's over here, right? And it's between these, you know, this angle is between these two lines. This angle is between two different lines. But the, ang the, the values of those two angles are the same. So this is an important thi uh, thing you have to do to, to solve mechanics problems. And if you have trouble with this, just come by and see me, okay? But um, I'll I usually just leave that to you to, to figure out. But if, you ha if you're having trouble, we can sit down and talk about it. Simple, simple geometry. And after a while, you're not gonna, you won't think about it too much. But in the beginning, you want to you want to be careful here. Um, so, okay, let's look at this. So I'm going to draw. Here's my here's my diagram, right? I got this mass up here. For my force diagram, representing the mass as a point right here. This is the angle I'd like to deal with. So I need to find the relationship between this angle and that angle. Well, um, you can see that if we superimpose this on here, here's the surface. So the angle I'm after, this is a right angle. This is the angle that I'm after. That's this angle right here, okay? And I can see that because I've sort of superposed these two things. Or I've just looked at this and said, you know, that's the angle I want. Okay, so how do you get that angle? Anybody? This is the right triangle. What's this? 90 minus theta, right? 
But there's another one here. What's this? This is 90 minus theta. This is 90 minus, 90 degrees minus, 90 degrees minus theta. Remember this? This is 90 degrees minus theta. These have to add to 90, so this has to be theta. That's got to be theta. So that's that's all there is to the, but it, that's all there is to it. But in the beginning, you may need to go through this a little bit to make make sure you see these angles. So we do a lot of this in mechanics, so much that after a while you really won't think about it much anymore. Okay, so that's the normal force. The next one is tension. We talked a little bit about this before. When we have um, a flexible, any kind of flexible cord. Okay, like a string or a rope. Now ropes can, may not be all that flexible, but it's not, not going to be important to us. Thread, whatever. There's a force that, um, you know, for example, here's an example. Oh, forget all this. Okay, so I've got some kind of string here preventing this from accelerating down the plane. Okay, and we'll assume there's no, don't worry about friction here, okay? So there's obviously a force exerted by the string here in that direction, preventing the mass from sliding. That force is the tension force. And in this class, we're going to deal with tension forces in flexible cords. So a flexible cord can't, it can only exert a force tangential to its, um, tangential to its length. This is the cord right here. And it's, um, it's being stretched here. It exerts a force this way. This is the tension. This is the tensional force. Can it exert a perpendicular force like this? No, not if it's flexible. It just can't support it. If I tried, if I tried, if I attached this to something and tried to pull it this way to see if there's any, it's just going to move over. Okay, but that's not true. This is not a big deal, but I just want to point it out to you. What about a rod? A rod can have tension, right? So in the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, <laughs> I keep, oh working on every time I get a chance. There are these suspension cables, right? It's a suspension bridge. This bridge and it had these cables. There's tension in those cables, right? And um, however, can there be a force, can a cable exert a force this way? Like a rod? Oh yeah, yeah this rod right now, when I go like this, okay, I'm exerting a force that way, it's exerting an equal and opposite force. The for you can have a component of the force perpendicular. We don't want to deal with that. I don't think we're going to deal with that in this course, okay? So we're going to, when we talk about tension, even though a cable, a rod like this can have tension in it, it can also have something perpendicular, tension this way, it can also have a perpendicular force. But if it's perfectly flexible, you can't have that. And that's going to be our main, what we're mainly going to deal with. Another thing we're going to deal with is we're going to neglect, often we can neglect the mass of a cord, okay? So here's an example. Uh, hold on a second, Let me make sure. I'm so here's an example, we put a mass here. If the mass, if this mass is much greater than the mass of the string, which is typically the case, we can consider the string to be massless. And you know, there's no such thing as a massless spring, but what we mean by that is the mass is negligible compared to other typical masses in the problem. So when I put this string under tension like this, okay, I'm not going to worry about the fact that it's, it's actually going to be sagging a little bit, right? But you know from common experience that when you put any kind of typically reasonable mass here, the spring's going to be essentially horizontal, right? Unless you have a very light mass. So we'll often make the assumption that, that the mass of the string is negligible. 
Um, okay, now there's something else I'm going to talk about with, in regard to tension. Um, first of all, I, I, I missed, didn't say something here. You can define, a, a, a nice way of thinking about tension is you've got some cord, some string or something like that. Here it is. You can imagine going in and cutting it and putting a little spring scale in here. You know, like this. So imagine this is tiny. We don't want it to be large compared to our apparatus. We have a little tiny version like this and we imagine cutting, cutting the spring and inserting this. We can, this is also calibrated in newtons. On, I don't know if you can see, on the right here it's newtons. So all I have to do, this is a sort of an operational definition of tension. Not that it's a kind of Gedanken oper a thought experiment kind of way of appreciating tension. I cut, I cut the spring. I may have to hold it or it may fly apart, right? But I imagine, imagine cutting it and putting a little scale in here. That reading is going to be the tension. That's the tension. So I think that helps, helps in the appreciation of tension. So there's another thing we need to know about tension here. Here's a setup here. It's in equilibrium. Look at, focus your attention on a segment of the string here. It's not moving. The net force has to be zero, right? Now again, we're neglecting, we're assuming it's not, we're not going to worry about gravity here. S small, negligible. So I know that this part, this string is going to be exerting a tension force on that spring. That comes from my, the idea of the spring, right? And I know that this part is going to be exerting a tension force that way. What must be the relationship between those two tensions? They've got to be the same. Tension is usually considered to be a scalar, but it really has direction, you know, but it has direction too. These forces here have to be equal and opposite, because otherwise this element would accelerate, okay? So, we can summarize that by saying the tension here, whatever tension there is here, is transmitted all along the string here. It's got the same tension everywhere, all right? What happens when we encounter the pulley? Well, if it's an ideal pulley, no friction, if it has no friction, this same argument applies. The tension just gets transmitted right around there. And this is, and you, now you can see why it's useful. The tension here in the string is going to be the same as the tension down here. The magnitude of the tension, which is, that's why we often, when we say tension, we really mean magnitude, okay? So I can draw the force diagram now on this. There's mg down, here's the force diagram, mg down, and there's this tension force up. And the same tension force as it is up here. And what do I conclude the tension has to be in this case? Because there's no motion. Mg. It's got to be Mg. So we'll do, this is the beginning of solving problems. What we're doing here, um, and we will, let me, I think it may be better to skip this. What if, um, this is in equilibrium, but if it were accelerating, suppose this were accelerating downward for some, we had another block here or something like that, we'll solve that problem. If it's accelerating downward, now what must be the relationship here between the tension and the weight? Weight is more than tension. Right, exactly. Tension is going to have to be less than the weight. So we'll solve that. That's a standard, standard problem. We'll solve problems like that. Standard. Okay, so any questions so far? At this point, we're ready to now do, do you know, serious problems. We're going to start off slow and simple, and then it'll get more complicated, more interesting later. So here's a standard first problem, the inclined plane. Um, we have, we're going to assume we have a, uh, this is an air track, right? No friction, we're not going to worry about friction. Uh, there's necessarily a normal force here. What is the acceleration of this mass down the incline? Or up, you know, we can give it any initial velocity we want. The acceleration is going to be independent of that velocity. Right, it's like free fall. I release something from rest, it has a certain acceleration. What if I throw it upward? Same acceleration, right, we talked about that. Or throw it downward, right, same thing here. So. We want to find the acceleration for negligible friction. Here's, um, here's our diagram, okay? 
we draw, we represent this like a point, the, the mass is a point, and we draw all the forces on there. So there's going to be a weight that's directly downward, there's going to be a normal force here at some angle to this weight. What is that angle? Well, I, here, here's the, what we just talked about, okay, here it is written down in the problem here, okay. So you want to carefully do this, you want to realize that this angle is identical to this angle. Because once we draw this, we're through with this. This is where we're going to, this is where we really um, start to do the calculation. <coughs> now, it's natural to choose this is our x direction down the plane and y perpendicular. That's at our disposal what we call the uh, x and y axes, right? As long as it's an inertial frame, it's not rotating in time, right? So we're going to call down the x axis like that and y perpendicular. So I have a weight, I have a normal force, and I need to resolve the weight into components, x and y components, to make progress here. There's other ways to do it, but this is the simplest. <coughs> if you don't see that, don't worry, you will in a moment. So, I want to get rid of this vector. That's what these, the striking, this, these hash marks, whatever you want to call them here. I'm going to replace this vector with vectors in the x direction here and the y direction. I think you can see the right triangle. See this right triangle right here? I know that if this is mg, this is going to have to be mg times, it's going to have to be this right here is the same as this. It's going to have to be mg times the cosine of theta. And this is mg times the sine of theta, which is similar there. So this is now gone from the problem. And how can we do that? How can we replace a force with its components. How, why can we get away with that? It's actually an assumption. And what's it called? The principle of superposition. Remember that? So, and it actually is an assumption. It's a very natural so, uh, thing, thing to assume. We're saying that here's the fo there's a downward force here. But I'm going to pretend that that's not there. And instead, there's a force this way and a force that way. This object can't tell the difference. It's going to have the same acceleration. It can't distinguish between those two cases. That's the principle of superposition here. And what's interesting, of course, is it's not always true. There are examples where it's, but in this class, it's going to be true. <coughs> OK, so what's the next step? Diagram, um, sort of diagram picture. Of, of, of the system, some kind of sketch, force diagram, and then Newton's laws. It's Newton's second law. So in the y direction, what do we have? What's the acceleration in the y direction? Zero. There's no acceleration perpendicular to the incline. So what does that tell us here? What has to be true? N has to equal mg cosine theta, without a doubt. Similarly, in the x direction, we know that this force must be this mass times its acceleration in the x direction. But that's the only acceleration, so we'll just call that A. We won't call it AX. It's natural just to drop the X here. So we have two equations here. The first one, we're applying Newton's second law in two perpendicular directions. The first one tells us what the normal force is. The second one tells us what the acceleration is. And it's g times the sine of theta. And immediately we should check this. Does it work for theta is equal to 0? Yeah, there's nothing wrong. We did this for any theta here. So we can let theta go to 0. It better give us the right answer. What, what does the formula tell us? What's the sine of 0? Zero? 0. So the formula is telling us that when theta is equal to 0, we have no acceleration. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. What about the other case? Oh, and incidentally, what's the normal force when theta is equal to zero? N is equal to mg. It works there. We, already, we talked about that. Now let's go to the other extreme. Let's have an inclined plane where we'll release a mass here and it goes like this. It better be g. <laughs> and sure enough, when theta is equal to 90, we get it works. And I didn't put it in here, but what's the normal force when we release this here? The formula is, tell, is telling us it's zero, because the cosine of 90 is zero. And does that make sense to you? Yeah, there's really no, you know, I can imagine putting a little gap in there, and that's not going to change the motion. There's, there's no, um, 
there's no normal force. There's no normal force in this case. <coughs> Now, I want to point some, oh, it's, where is it? Huh. So, the normal force here, remember we found it, it's for a horizontal plane, it's mg. When you incline the plane, it's less. It gets less. And you actually know that has to be the case, because when you go to 90 degrees, there's not going to be any normal, any normal force. So the normal force is not an absolute, you know, thing here. It depends on the geometry. <coughs> but we get at it. With Newton's second, you know, by drawing the force diagram and then from the force diagram applying Newton's second law. Okay, any questions about uh, that that problem? It's like our first, you know, uh, dynamics problem. <coughs> um, okay, we're going to do one more here. This is an example of what's called static equilibrium. There is no motion. Here. There's no motion. We have some mass. It's told, we're, we know it's three kilograms. And it's not moving. <coughs> and the, there's ropes or whatever connected to it to buy, from these walls here. And one of these ropes is horizontal, and the other one is inclined with this angle up here on this wall. So there's going to be tension in these ropes, right? And let's call, and it, it's, uh, you wouldn't expect it to be the same. If it happens to be, the math will tell us. Okay, so I'm going to call this T1 and this T2. And the problem here is to find those tensions. To find the tensions. And you know, I, I should say, what's a, well, let me ask you, what's a practical consequence of this? this, this engineers do this all the time. You know, this, whatever cord we're using here is going to have some kind of ta rating, some kind of strength, kind of tension that it'll handle. If you go beyond that tension, it can break. So I may want to know if the rope I'd like to use, you know, the cheapest possible rope, right? <laughs> can, I, can I use it without it breaking? So you would do this cal the calculation we're going to do here to make sure that these tensions are less than the, you know, the maximum tension for, that, for the rope. <coughs> Okay, here's the, the kind of the picture. What's next? Force diagram, okay? So here's my mass. I've got T1 this way. I've got T2 that way. I'm gonna call this the X direction. I'm gonna call this the Y direction. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got three forces. T1, T2, and gravity. So gravity, T1 and gravity are already in pure, in. Um, they have a pure single component. Ty only points in the y direction, in the x direction. Mg only points in the y direction. But T2 we have to resolve into x and y directions. So again, we do this little bit of trigonometry. What I care about now is this angle, but that's obviously 50 degrees because these two angles have to, if, in, for this right triangle, these two have to add to be 90. <coughs> so now, Newton's second law. There's no force in the x direction. So what has to be true? T1 has to equal T2 times the cosine of, I'm going to call this theta. This is not called, this is just, we're given this is 40 degrees. It's convenient for me, I'm just going to call this angle theta and carry it through and plug the numbers in in the end. T1 has to be T2 times the cosine of theta. These have to balance because there's no acceleration in any direction here. So I write that down, I get this. What about in the y direction? Again, this is static equilibrium, no acceleration. So this has to equal that. So I write that down. And now I've got two equations in two unknowns. We're trying to find T1 and T2. And in fact, the second equation is one equation and one unknown, isn't it? So I can find T2. I should go ahead and do that. It's 38.4 newtons. <clears throat> Once I've got that, I can take it and substitute it into here, or you can eliminate, algebraically eliminate T2. I, I tend to do that. You can skip this if you want and just go straight to here. Now that we found T2, we can plug it in and find T1, and it's that. Okay, now, any questions? Okay, so that's a static equal, called a static equilibrium problem. We found the tensions. Can we test this experimentally? 
Well, see, we would have to. Anybody ever used a tension meter? They, I, I, I don't think I've ever seen one. But there are ways of measuring tensions in, in, a, in a string, a cord or a rope or something like that. And what it, I think what they do is, it's some kind of you know handheld device, and it exerts a a known force perpendicular and sees what how, how much deflection there is or something like that. There's a way that you can do it. They're called they're called tension meters or tensiometers is the old expression, but I think that's gone now. It's just tension meter. Why don't we just call it what it is, right? So we could do that, but that's we, we have to find them, you know, and there's we can be more clever here. Can you measure the displacement, how much it stretches before it breaks? Oh, uh, uh, See, we want to verify our theory here. We want to verify the theory, right? We want to verify these numbers. So here's what we're going to do, and I'll set this up this afternoon. We'll, I'll bring it in tomorrow. We're going to create this system, but we're going to use the predicted tensions here. How can I supply a known tension here? It's really easy. Anybody? I want to, I'm going to supply the predicted values here. How can I? Well, I put a pulley here have it go, the string go over to a hanging weight. So it's, and I do the same thing here. So I'll build this, you'll see it tomorrow. So this is kind of interesting. We're gonna turn the tables on this. We're gonna set up a demo where we have these tensions and see if we get 90 degrees and 40 degrees. According to the theory, it should kind of have that reversibility to it. You know, given this, we find this. We should be able to go the opposite way. And it's convenient in the demonstration to set this up and see if we get those angles. If we don't get those angles, something's wrong somewhere, either in the theory or the experiment, or in my case, often both. <laughs> okay. Just put on from the past.